So we want to talk this week about some recent scientific discoveries. We're in a real science-oriented society, aren't we? And anything big that happens gets splashed on the front pages. And uh, so there are a lot of things going on that actually fit in and make us think about Christianity. So before we do that and talk about some of the new things, I want to give you kind of a, um, a quick history. We're going to go through a few thousand years here. I don't want you to be in a class and have a teacher say to you, well, you know, science and Christianity have always fought. No, they haven't. This is what's really astounding. Science, the kind of science that you experience when you go into your classes and the kind of science that is on television and in National Geographic and Smithsonian magazines and all this stuff, that kind of science, the modern view of science, came from, guess what, the Judeo-Christian worldview, from the Jews and the Christians. It came from the Bible. And most people don't think of that. They say, what? It did. And, and let me give you, and I want to spend just a couple minutes on this because I think it's really important. What kind of God do we encounter in the Bible that would make people think about becoming scientists and going out and exploring and understanding their world? Well, how about first of all, would you agree that the, the God that you see in the Bible is a rational being? He seems rational, doesn't he? I mean, he lays out this creation very carefully, and all through the rest of the Bible, he's laying out a plan of salvation. This is really different than, uh, for example, the Greek gods. You ever read any of the stories about the Greek gods? They're like little kids, right? They're always arguing, and they fight, and they squabble, and they lay curses on each other, and they don't like each other very well, and, and they're just chaotic. And you never know whether you're on a God's good side or a bad side. Uh, so th there are very different views of that. If you were a Greek and you had that kind of worldview, you might think, well, this world is probably fairly chaotic, right? Our gods are chaotic, but the God of the Bible wasn't. So there's a reassurance that was given to a lot of people who wanted to become scientists and wanted to explore the world. They said, you know, God laid it out in a rational fashion. I bet we could understand it. Secondly, God is separate from his creation. That seems obvious when you read Genesis, right? He says, let there be something, but that something was not him. But there are other religious beliefs around the world that say God is in rocks, God is in the water, God is in the tree. Well, if that's the case, would you really want to do any science? You wouldn't want to cut a tree down to see what's going on inside the tree. You wouldn't want to open up a, a fish to see how a fish works because you're messing with God, right? So we don't believe that. Right? Christians and Jews didn't believe that. They said that's a separate creation. So it's okay to go out into it and, and mess around with it. Nature's not sacred. Nature's great, but it's not sacred. So it's okay to go out and do some experimentation. Thirdly, according to Genesis, people are created in the image of God. Why would that give scientists, early scientists, a little bit of uh, encouragement to know that? Yeah. I guess like when we study ourselves, we kind of study God because we're created like Him. So. Sure. Yeah. It, would that give you encouragement to go out and, and try to figure out things in the world? It, you must have a mind, and if God gave you the mind, and yet we have some aspects of God within us, not obviously the, the, to the extent God has, but we probably are rational too. Now, we do some stupid things, we all do that, but we have at least some part of rationality, right? So it's okay, we go out in the world, we may be able to figure some things out, because God created us in his own image. Creation was called good, right? It was called a good thing. It's, it wasn't evil, so it's okay again to go out and experience the world. It wasn't evil. And then finally, by the way, there, there are more reasons. I'm just giving you a few of them why science came out of Christianity and the uh, Judeo-Christian worldview. The Christians and the Jews say the world is, is there. It's really there. And you say, well, yeah, that's obvious. I, I cracked my shins on a table the other day or whatever. Yeah, but there are some religious groups. Take the uh, Eastern religions like the Hindus. They say the world is an illusion. Well, wait a minute. If it's an illusion, would you spend your life trying to figure it out? Why would you figure it out an illusion? Just forget it. So you don't get science coming out of the Hindu world. You don't get science coming out of the African world. You don't get science out of uh, Asia. You don't. Now you get some smart, <coughs> smart cultures, no doubt about it. But where did modern science come from? The Judeo-Christian worldview. So if you look back, uh, if you've ever done a class that's looked at some famous scientists, guess what? About 99.9% .9 of those earlier. Scientists were Christians, Galileo and Copernicus and Newton and on and on and on. They were Christians. In fact, Kepler, who uh, did a lot as far as astronomical um, orbits and things like that, he said, all I'm doing is thinking God's thoughts after him. Isn't that a neat way to think about it? 
He says, God did it first. I'm just trying to figure out how he did it. Right? So that's, that was the attitude. Great optimism. So I just wanted you to think about that first before we get into the modern science. It started out as a Judeo-Christian uh, project, right? So the scientists came out of that. But something kind of went haywire along the way. Do you remember my little box that I gave you last week, a little image of a box? Well, it's back. So what happened is like in the 1600s, 1700s, you had something called the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was basically people deciding thanks but no thanks to God. And for the first time, they centered life just on the human race and kind of ignored God. And so that, that's what this box illustrates again, that that box is the universe. There's nothing outside of it. You know, it's just kind of hanging in midair. So the scientists now start saying, you know, let's forget the idea of God. Let's just look at the box. Let's just kind of dig in there and see what's inside the box, right? There's nothing outside it. There's no supernatural. This is just everything that we're going to focus on. So Darwin comes along and he looks inside that box and he says, well, if there's no hand of God, then all that stuff that started out at the universe, uh, you know, with just molecules and stuff, that has to happen somehow to turn into man, right? So evolution is kind of a natural idea, isn't it? If there's no God, what else have you got? Nothing, uh, right? The, the, the small stuff has to turn into the big stuff. The uncomplicated has got to turn into the complicated. So that's where evolution comes from. So you've got kind of an abandonment of God going on as far as science goes. But here's the good news. Here's the fun part that we're going to focus on today. You saw the box hanging in midair. So what do we got today? We got a box that has something outside of it. Do you see the apple trees in the background there? So now we've got a box that's filled, but it had to be filled from somewhere outside, right? Somebody went and picked those apples and put them in that big uh, apple container there. That's the biggest box I've ever seen. I was totally impressed. That's a lot of apples. <laughs> a lot of apples in there. So along comes somebody from the outside to put things into the box. And that's what we're starting to discover in this world today. When scientists are looking out at things, they're saying, hmm, we're not so sure that there's just an empty box with nothing around it. We're starting to think that there is some kind of input coming from the outside. And we're going to talk about these six areas today. So the beginning of the universe, the beginning of life, and so on. So everybody okay at this point? Or anybody have a question about what I'm talking about? We're all right? Okay. I just need to move over here so I give you guys a chance to see the, the screen once in a while. So let's take the first one here. This is uh, the idea of the beginning of the universe. Um, I could have illustrated, I guess I could have brought a balloon with me. So if you can picture, this is sort of like the idea of a balloon. Those are not different universes existing. That's over time, right? The universe is expanding. So think of it like a balloon. You blow the balloon up, and if you have dots on the balloon that might represent stars, galaxies, they would appear to be kind of flying apart from each other, wouldn't they? If you lived on one of those dots, you'd look out and you'd see all the other dots moving away from you as the uh, balloon grew bigger. Well, the same thing is going on with the universe. Uh, back in the 1920s, a guy named Edwin Hubble. You heard of the Hubble telescope? Yeah, it was named after this Edwin Hubble. He was the first guy to look out there and say, oh, well, he had a new telescope, so that was a lot of fun for him. It was up in uh, Los Angeles, Mount Wilson. They had this brand new telescope, huge, 100-inch mirror, right, 100 inches around. So he looked out. He got the best view of anybody. He was able to look out there, and he said, wow. And after a lot of measurements, he saw the universe was actually moving apart. And so then they say, well, so what's going on there? Well, they said, let's call it the Big Bang. It was actually named the Big Bang as a joke. The guy that named it didn't like it. He didn't like the theory. He said, yeah, right. Because up till then, everybody thought the universe had just always been here, right? Just kind of some stars came into existence, some stars went out of existence, but it had always been here. And then all of a sudden comes this guy's theory that says, no, no, the universe had a starting point. There was nothing, and then there was something. There was no... There was no matter, time, energy, nothing, nothing, and then it all came into existence. Well, the initial reaction was really interesting to see from the scientists. For example, there's a guy named uh, Eddington. You can look him up sometime. He's a really, really famous physicist, English physicist. People flocked to hear him and read his books. He said the idea of the beginning of a universe is repugnant to me. I just thought that was an interesting thing for a scientist to say. I mean, think about that. If, if you're working math somewhere, and you, you never say, ooh, I don't like this equation. I mean, it either works or it doesn't work, right? Isn't that how math and, and all sorts of forms of uh, science is supposed to work? You just, it, it works, it doesn't work, instead of, ooh, right? What, what kind of scientist says, ooh? That's an odd thing to say. But Eddington says, I don't like this. 
And then somebody that even took it further as far as not liking it was somebody pretty well known, Albert Einstein. He didn't like the idea of an expanding universe. So you know what he did? He cheated. He took some mathematical equations and made them look like, based on his equations, that the universe was not expanding. And later on, he finally had to admit, yeah, it really is expanding. He said, that was the biggest mistake of my life. So if a guy like Einstein can fudge his numbers, there's something going on there, right? When another scientist can say, gee, I don't like this theory. So my question to you at this point is, why do you think a lot of scientists were dragged kicking and screaming to the idea of the Big Bang, considering that 100 years earlier, they flocked to Darwin, right? They liked Darwin's idea. They, even though there's no proof for Darwin at the time, there's just minimal proof, they flocked to him. But they didn't flock to the Big Bang. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. That's a good point, right? That, it's a brand new thing. It, it's, you don't have to think about it if you just say it's always been here, you know, done. Anything from a spiritual perspective, you think? Yeah. Yeah, it just goes back to the same thing as faith. I mean, if you, if, if you have faith to believe, if you have to have faith to believe it, there's going to be a lot of doubt. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? I was just curious what you thought. Yeah. Well, it, it brought their world here. You know, they, they wanted to look, they had a preconceived idea of how they wanted the universe to be and the facts came back in and they said that's not correct. There's a point in time where everything came to be. Yeah, if you have a natural world, or I'm going to emphasize that word natural world, but something outside of nature had to bring it into existence, what do you call that? Supernatural, right? Ooh, that's starting to sound like the G word, God, huh? Oh, well some scientists weren't real crazy about that idea. Are you dragging God into this thing? How are we going to deal with that? Yeah. Yeah. The same thing. It's almost like starting to like lean closer and closer to the Bible. Yeah, it's starting to sound like what does it say at the beginning of the Bible? Let there be light. And that's what they were discovering. The universe started in a flash of light and then it was off and running. Oh, that's uh, starting to pinch, right? It's starting to sound a little bit like a religious uh, viewpoint there. So here we go again. Do you hear from last week what the same thing is going on? We have philosophy as well as science. It's not just the scientists saying, that's okay, we're going to follow the evidence wherever it leads. No. You have a guy like Einstein that says, I don't want to follow the evidence wherever it leads, I'm going to change it. And so he changes the quote evidence through his equations and had to back up on that. Oops, that was a mistake. So there was a real reluctance. But the Big Bang is actually now considered the most um, settled theory in, in science. They've spent so much time working on that and they keep refining it and refining it. But generally it's an accepted theory today. But here's good news, right, as far as Christianity goes. Don't think of it like a grenade going off, right? So it's not just bang and, and a grenade, you know, somebody can stand right there and not be hurt because somehow the fragments just kind of randomly head off in different directions. It's not that. It's actually a very carefully controlled expansion. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit later on. It echoes the Bible. I don't know how many, how many of you have ever looked at these verses. There are about three or four just in Isaiah. I'm just going to read one of them to you. It's up here on the board. But one of the verses of Isaiah is a real uh, eye-opener, right? Here's what it says, Isaiah 40, 22. He, talking about God, stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent. Does that sound pretty modern? Yeah, Isaiah was like 700 B.C. And what's he sounding like? He's sounding like Hubble. Right? He says there's an expansion. I mean, think about a tent. You go to the beach, you got a tent, or you got uh, a canopy of some kind for shade. What do you have? You have a small area that becomes large area as you expand this thing. That's what Isaiah says is going on in the heavens. And he, his is not the only place that talks like that. It's in Job and some other places as well. The Big Bang is not a threat to Christianity, right? Because something outside has to get it going. Somebody once said, I thought this was pretty funny, if there's a Big Bang, you need a Big Banger. <laughs> Right? Or think of it this way. Somebody's got to strike the match that lights the fuse that sets the whole thing off. So I don't know how you want to think of it, but how do you get something from nothing? There's got to be something outside of it. The universe can't create itself. Something's got to bring it into existence. And so the Big Bang is certainly not a threat. In fact, now some scientists are saying things like this. Discover Magazine. Not, by the way, I'm going to be mentioning a lot of uh, people and a lot of uh, like newspapers or whatever. I'm trying to pick ones that are not Christian because that would be our best defense, wouldn't it? 
If you just pick Christians and say, see, this Christian says this and this Christian says that, somebody else outside that field or outside that faith is going to say, well, of course, they're just Christians. They're just in this thing together. So I'm trying to pick organizations or whatever that don't buy into the Christian worldview but are still honest enough to say things like this. Discover Magazine is not a Christian journal. It's a science journal. Here's what it says. The universe is unlikely, very unlikely. And then if that isn't enough, then they put the next sentence in italics, right? Stress, deeply, shockingly unlikely. Right? So how do you get a universe? And they say, I don't know, it's, it's so unlikely. Three Stanford physicists, not Christians, they wrote this article. I'm going to go down to the bottom first, actually, because that's kind of fun. They, they wrote an article in a science journal that got published. It was called Disturbing Implications. It had a longer title. But the idea was they found it very disturbing to have a Big Bang. Why did they find it disturbing? Well, here's part of their quote that they did in an interview. Arranging the universe as we think it's arranged would have required what? A miracle. Hey, we know about miracles, right? Now, they're not going to credit God yet, but they just say, you know, it requires a miracle. An unknown agent. Hmm. Do we have an idea who that agent might be? Yeah. We'd be glad to help them out. That's okay. Let them keep going. An unknown, ag unknown agent beyond space and time, right? It's got to be uh, beyond the universe. It's beyond space, time, matter, and energy. Intervened in the evolution of the universe for reasons of its own. I like the it's. <laughs> They're, they're trying to be pretty vague at that point, but do you see what they're having to say? It's a miracle. It's just totally irrational to get something from nothing. And so they call it not just an implication, they call it a disturbing implication. We're back to the ooh factor again, right? Isn't that like Eddington? I find it repugnant. These guys find it disturbing. Why would you find that disturbing? I don't know. I think it's very comforting to think that a God out there is so majestic he can bring something into existence that wasn't there before, but they find that disturbing. I'm going to spend less time on this because I know we talked about it some last week. So the first issue is getting the universe going, but once you get the universe, how has it been trying to get life started? Because remember, you got that empty box, life, you have to look in that box and you have to have life making itself get going. And uh, we talked about this little experiment in the 50s that they tried uh, to, to create amino acids. It was a failure. People like Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, said this. Every time I write a paper on the origins of life, I swear I'll never write another one because there's too much speculation running after too few facts. What's a speculation? Yeah? A guess. It's a guess. Right? So they got plenty of guesses. No problem coming up with guesses. They can't find any evidence. And so Francis Crick, a guy who knows life, he knows things about life, he says, nah, he said, I'm not going to write any more papers on the origin of life. Michael Denton, not a Christian. What does he say? The complexity of the simplest known type of cell is so great, right? Just a single cell. He says it's so complex. And you saw something on that last week when you saw the uh, little motor, that little whip that spins around inside a bacteria. But he says, just forget the, the, that whip, just the cell itself. He said, it's so great that it's impossible to accept that such an object could have been thrown together suddenly by some kind of freakish, vastly improbable event. Such an occurrence would be indistinguishable from what? There it is again, miracle. So he's even admitting, we're in the ballpark of miracle here, folks, right? There's no other way around it. And then finally, I love this, uh, this image here. A professor of biology at Princeton said this, the probability of life just coming about, he says from accident, is comparable to the probability of going to a print shop and blowing it up and have all those little tight pieces fly up in the air and come down and go brrrr, and you create an unabridged dictionary. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen, right? You're going to get an explosion, you'll get you know, letters all over the place, you're not going to get any sense out of that. He says, that's the same odds, right? How are you going to get life from non-life? Well, try blowing up a print shop and, and getting a dictionary out of that. Uh, let me stop for just a second and, and give you an illustration of why they're so frustrated and, and what the problem is. Amino acids and proteins. Okay, so let's talk about those two for just a second. Amino acids are, are compounds, right? they're made of different molecules. And they form proteins, which are bigger, more complex molecules. You've got to have proteins, right? If you, if you don't have proteins, you don't have life. The fact that you're sitting here and breathing and doing all the stuff you're doing, it's proteins inside of you. And you have to have a bunch of different types of proteins to help you do the things it talks about here, structure, function, regulation of your tissues and organs. So here's the deal. If you look over on the right side here, 
amino acids. Remember the film that we saw inside the cell when they were uh, making the amino acids and they were forming into uh, proteins? So first of all, you've got to get amino acids, right? So you've got to have the right kinds of amino acids. Then they have to line up and form these chains called peptides. Right? So just, it's a fancy word. It just means a chain of amino acids. And then once you get the chain of them, then you've got to fold them. They, they have to fold in a precise manner. You can't just crumble up a bunch of protein, uh, sorry, crumble up a bunch of amino acids and get yourself life. They have to form and twist and turn and get themselves folded precisely right to get a protein. Once you've got a protein, you're on your way. Well, people have done studies about how hard it is to get the amino acids to do their thing and then to get them to fold just right. I ran out of room on here. The odds of getting one protein, one protein, out of a string of 100 amino acids, because they don't line up very well uh, on their own. It's very, very difficult to get that to happen. It's one in, and then I put a bunch of, ze <laughs> bunch of zeros. I finally ran out of space, and I needed to put 91 more zeros. Okay, so that's a pretty big odd, right? You would not play anything in, at Vegas at that kind of odds, right? You'll never win. Uh, that number is more than the total atoms in the universe. Okay, so think of it this way. Here are your odds. You grab all the atoms in the universe, right? Every star, every planet, every disk of gas, whatever it is. You get it all in one area. You paint one atom, throw it in the mix, and ask somebody to pick that atom out. Out of all the atoms in the universe, that's the odds of getting one protein folded up just right to be able to use. And the minimal life requires 250 of these. So you've got to do it 250 times, right? You've got to pick that one atom out 250 times. Good luck. But those are the odds, right? That's how you supposedly get life from non-life. It's, it's basically zero opportunity, right? Just zero chance at this point. How about a few more discoveries about getting life started? Well, just recently up at UCLA, some scientists, geochemists, said, you know, we've studied this. We think life started really soon. As, just the minute the Earth was prepared and ready to go and had the right qualities for life, life pops up. And one said, life on Earth may have started almost instantaneously. Well, how in the world, I, you know, most people say, well, you know, over billions of years, maybe, you know, things happen and you get the chemistry just right and you get the molecules just right and you get the atmosphere just right, then maybe life will come along. That's not what happened. The minute, they said, according to UCLA people, the minute the, the earth was ready, boom, there's life. That doesn't sound like a random process to me. Then you've got something else. Again, we're still talking origin of life. Anybody heard of the Cambrian explosion? Time Magazine did. They put it on one of their covers. They called it Evolution's uh, Big Bang. Here we are, one more time. We're going to do three Big Bangs today, right? One's going to be the cosmological Big Bang. Here's the second one. Evolution's got a Big Bang as well. You know, rocks come in kind of like layers that geologists look at, and they give them names, different time periods. As you go down, you get further and further in the past. So there's this one time period called the Cambrian period. And they've found all over the world a bunch of new animal life just popping out of nowhere. And one of them was this thing called a trilobite. You ever seen trilobites? They're kind of like weird looking crab-like creatures. They're very sophisticated compared to what was going on before. It's like they just show up. And it's not just them, it's a whole bunch of little critters. So I just gave you an illustration there. Some are pretty bizarre looking, huh? Uh, creatures of nightmares, maybe. <laughs> But anyway, all of these just come about. And so the question is, and, and one, um, one person says this, he's a scientist, PhD in zoology, I think he knows animals. The Cambrian explosion is not just a case of all the major animal phyla appearing at about the same place. He says there's a situation where there are no ancestors, right? There's nothing that prepares you to look at a trilobite or any of these other creatures. There's nothing like it in the previous rock level. He says, we don't know how they evolved. And of course, the big question is, so where are these intermediates, right, these transitions? It's, it's like minimal stuff and then a whole bunch of real advanced stuff. So where's that tree of life again? There's no tree of life. It's nothing and then a bunch of things. How about one more uh, section here about uh, life start? New York Times, not friendly to Christianity at all, but they had this report. The chemistry of the first life is a nightmare to explain. No one has yet developed a plausible explanation to show how the earliest chemicals of life might have constructed themselves from the inorganic, meaning not live, right? Inorganic chemicals likely to have been around in early Earth. A spontaneous assembly of RNA right inside the cell on the primitive Earth would have been a near miracle. Yeah, it's the third time we've heard that today, huh? 
two experts on the subject helpfully declared last year. If you want to hear the philosophy in action again, take a look at this next quote by a man who is a Harvard chemist. Again, not a friend of Christianity, but here's what he says. The origin of life. This problem is one of the big ones in science. Most chemists believe, as do I, that life emerged spontaneously from mixtures of molecules in the prebiotic earth. How? I have no idea. <laughs> but do you hear what's going on here? He says, I believe it. I can't find the evidence. That's not science, is it? That's philosophy at work. You know? He's got the, the goggles on or the, the glasses on saying, this is the way I see things. Right? I don't think there's a God. So this stuff's got to happen just automatically. It's got to come out of nowhere. But he says, I don't know how. I have no idea. Not just, well, I'm following a few trails. I'm, it's kind of fuzzy right now. I don't, I don't hear him saying that at all. He says, I have no idea. Well, at least he's honest, huh? But notice the honesty is revealing something there, that he, he had an idea before he really had any evidence. Then you've got SETI. Again, what's going on here? There was tremendous optimism back in the 60s. Uh, people did all these uh, calculations of how many planets were in the universe and uh, where they would be located. And they said, you know, there's got to be life everywhere. It's got to be, the, this universe has got to be just teeming with life. And so they started taking radio telescopes and turning them up to the sky and just kind of listening in, expecting to hear all sorts of intergalactic chatter. Right? Hey, how you doing? Fine, how are you? <laughs> Maybe something more serious than that, but it was the basis actually of a movie. Anybody ever see Contact? It's an older movie now, but uh, it, it's fun to watch. I mean, it's pretty interesting. But it's based on that uh, same idea of SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, S-E-T-I. So how's that optimism gone? For 50 years, they have been looking at this universe. Just recently, Penn State uh, scientists, they searched 100,000 galaxies, not stars, galaxies that are made of billions of stars. They searched 100,000 of them and came up zip, right? They, there's no life apparently out there, at least from what they've been able to detect. There's a book out now called Rare Earth, Not by Christians. And what does it say? It says, you know, we used to think life was everywhere. We're starting to think what? The Earth is pretty unusual. Paul Davies, I think I gave you this quote last week. He says, we're probably the only intelligent beings in the universe. How's that for kind of a scaled down optimism, right? It's not out there all over the place, you know, so enjoy your Star Trek and things like that. but. It doesn't appear to be uh, the kind of populated universe that people thought of. Scientific American, not a friend to Christianity, had this to say. Ex this is a title of one of their articles. Exoplanet senses. Okay, that's kind of fancy terminology. It means they're finding, they're starting to find other planets out there besides in our solar system, right? which is pretty cool. It's pretty amazing they can do that. So they did a census, right? They're, they've gone through and they've tried to you know, find out what types of planets are out there. It says... Here's the result. Suggests the Earth is a special place after all. Oh. So now we're kind of back to what they used to think hundreds of years ago. The Earth was special, and then the scientists came along and poo-pooed that idea. Said, no, life is everywhere. It's real easy to get it started. Oh, no. And now they're saying, you know, it's pretty amazing how special life is on Earth. Some people have gotten so desperate, they've come up with a theory called panspermia. And they say, maybe it's too hard to get life started here, but maybe... Uh, a big asteroid came into the Earth's atmosphere and it had life on it, right? Little microbes, and boom, it hits the atmosphere and it lands, breaks apart, and the little microbes walk out and say, hey, this is all right, I like this. And they multiply and there's, there's how you get life started. People that are even a little bit, I would say maybe over the edge, think that spacecraft may have come and uh, seeded our planet, right? They just open up their pod bay doors and out comes, I don't know, little critters, and then they headed off. Uh, I never knew if he was kidding or not, but Francis Crick, that guy that I just quoted the other, the other day, uh, the other uh, slide here, he, he, he says it may be spaceships. I don't know if he was kidding or not. But I mean, that's pretty desperate, isn't it? Where It's like, we don't get it, so we'll just bring life here from somewhere else. But isn't that just kicking the can down the road because where they come from on the other side? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, all you're doing is uh, not, not paying any attention at that point, right? You just, let's move on here. Yeah. So over the last few years, you see a lot of news about Mars and water. Yeah. Isn't that a, another way, because they've proven so much, or they struggle with this, that there, there's theories that life started on Mars, and it, that's why they look for water, because that's a component. Is that true? Yeah, that, um, 
You know, I love NASA. I grew up on the space program, but I'm, I'm kind of disappointed because I think now NASA is pushing this idea of life to get funding. Is that a cynical view? Maybe. But it's more glamorous, isn't it? If we could just find critters someplace, give us more money and we'll keep looking. And uh, I thought the idea was just explore, right? Just see what's out there. But it's, everything's about life now. And so, yeah, they, they really like the idea of Mars because they say there, there appears to be water under the surface. And so they want to dig down and do more things there. There's a moon or two that go around other planets, and they think some of those moons may have uh, an ocean down under their icy surface. There's a moon that goes around Saturn called Titan. It's got all sorts of hydrocarbons, and they want to explore that. And But yeah, I think you're right. I think it's now it's all a life search rather than... It seems that's where they, they switch, right, because of this science. So this yeah. The yeah. By the way, did you know some pieces of Mars have probably come to Earth? But there have been explosions in the past and, and chips of the planets has, have flown off and we probably have pieces of Earth up there on Mars. So even if they ever say they ever, they ever find life on Mars, I would, I would kind of question it, although it doesn't affect my faith at all. Does it yours if they find life in the universe? I don't think that's any big thing. I mean, God can create life wherever he wants to. But uh, anyway, pieces of, of our planet have gone to Mars and pieces of Mars have come to Earth. Uh, but they never found life uh, in either case. We'll go fairly quickly over this too, the challenges to evolution, because we talked a little bit about this last time. Philosophy more than science. Spontaneous generation, you can't get life going. Even if you get it going, how do you change it? Mutations are not doing the trick. And transitions are missing. Right. So these are the four that we discussed last week, so I'm going to move along. But I did want to give you some quotes to let you know it's not me making this stuff up. Again, this is coming from people that are not necessarily friends to Christians. Uh, one is a woman who is a uh, member of the U.S. Na National Academy of Sciences. She says, neo-Darwinists say that new species emerge when mutations occur, right? That's the idea. You get a mutation, and then you get a new species, eventually. I was taught over and over again that if you just accumulate these random mutations, it's going to lead to change, and that'll lead to new species. She says this, I believed it until when? Until I looked for evidence. <laughs> really? So they, again, do you hear what's going on here? They have their philosophy. It's got to be this way. And then they say, now let's go find evidence. Well, they haven't found the evidence. And so she says, new mutations don't create new species. They create offspring that are impaired. I mean, when I was in college, we used to mess with fruit flies and stuff like that. And they'd radiate those suckers trying to find, get some kind of new life out of it. What do you get? You get fruit flies with bad wings. <laughs> or fruit flies with bad uh, you know, uh, feelers or whatever it is. You, you ruin them, right? You never get a better fruit fly. And she's discovering that as well. Here's a science journalist. She says hundreds of those who would be called evolutionary scientists, not Christians, not creationists, they contend a natural selection, right? One of those things that they depend on for Darwin is politics. It's not science. It's politics. So there we go. It's the philosophy first, right? The evidence isn't there. So it's about getting the money. It's about keeping your, your fame. It's keeping a position rather than losing your job because you're not buying into the evolution thing. If you want to see a good DVD that explores this angle of the politics of it, there's one called Expelled, E-X-P-E-L-L-E-D. And it, it tells you people are losing their jobs because they're starting to question Darwin. Be because it is politics. It's, it's money involved, it's prestige, and so a lot of people are actually uh, getting uh, really uh, harassed for that. And here's a person who's a National Center of Bi a Biotechnology uh, member. The modern synthesis, he's talking about Darwin. The modern synthesis has crumbled, apparently beyond repair. Not to mince words, the modern synthesis is gone. So this is what they're saying behind the scenes. They can't get life started, and uh, now they've got to search for something else, right? The whole Darwinian thing seems to be on shaky ground. How about a couple more critics here? Two people who are professors, one in Iowa, one out here in California. Darwinism can no longer serve as a general framework for evolutionary theory. We've got to toss Darwin. Well, there's a vested interest. People have spent their lives, they've written books, they've got prestige, and it's going to be hard for them to let go. But you hear people are already starting to say, come on, guys, it's not working, let's toss it. We've got to come up with something new. One person who did suggest very strongly out in public wrote a book about it, Thomas Nagel, he's a philosopher and an atheist. He said the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. Boy, did he get harassed for that. He, he got all sorts of flack. People were so angry at him. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Somebody's pulling the curtain back. 
and, and showing you what's really there. And, and so people were angry at him. How about Franklin Harold, professor of biology in Colorado? There are presently no detailed Darwinian accounts for the evolution of any biochemical system, only a variety of wishful speculations. We're back to that word speculations again. They're just making notes it's wishful, right? Because it's the philosophy. It's like, we want this to be this way. So here's an idea, and then it falls flat. They don't get any proof. Hey, we got another idea here that has to support the philosophy, and they're not finding it. He says it's just wishful speculations. Yeah? And yet they persist in teaching it not as theory, but as fact in all the schools. I mean, they, there's no humility there. There's no, here's what our current thinking is, and there's no admission of this that trickles down to the school systems. Yeah. You know, they're, they're all, you know, indoctrinated, and yeah. this is the subtle science. That's yeah. very frustrating. Yeah. It's, really, it's become philosophy now. It's a, it's, it's a philosophical... Yeah. They, they cannot describe it in a scientific terms anymore. They're turning, turning, this is becoming a philosophical issue again, right? They're giving up, basically. Yeah. And so those areas where they treat it as fact in our textbooks on these to topics, it's essentially, it's really they're teaching philosophy there, or yeah. a question of philosophy. Yeah. And, and they don't switch gears and tell you that, but that's really what's going on there. Yeah, it's a shame. I, I don't know, I haven't kept up with biology textbooks, but it used to be that even the textbooks would have out-of-date information that would support evolution, even though the world inside of whatever it was, uh, physics or geology, it knew that those were incorrect. Uh, for example, I remember when I was a kid, they showed me pictures of these little four-footed animals and they said they, those had turned into horses. Right? It was like a five-step process. Well, just recently I found out, I'd forgotten about it, I, just recently I found out that those were different animals that they just put together in a chain and called those the background of the horse. Now they reject all of that, right? They don't know how the horse came about. So, But those pictures, I bet, are st still in some textbook somewhere. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it is unfortunate. Okay, again, we'll go fairly quickly over this thing about design, but we had talked about design in the past, both on the large scale, that's why I put two different pictures here. Large scale design is going on in the universe and on the small microscopic level that we looked at last week with the uh, little motors inside bacteria. There's design on the big scale and there's design on the small scale. So I got a picture here that I thought might kind of give us a visual image of what's happening. If you're in a submarine, this is like a World War II submarine, you had all these dials and gauges to look at. You better hope that every needle is exactly where it's supposed to be when you go down, right? Because you may go down and not come back up, right? It's a pretty spooky thing. So your life is on the line. You want to make sure every gauge is what you wanted. Well, we've got laws of physics that are going on all over the universe, right? Things have to be a certain way. I'm going to pick on gravity here for a minute. I know we talked about it briefly last week. But you've got things like this list here that have to be like a dial, have to be set just right or you don't get life. So here's one example, gravity. So I said, imagine a tape measure. So I got this out of a book and it really, I, I love analogies, that, it helps me picture things. He said gravity could be anything, right? It, could, it doesn't have to be the kind of weight that we have. It could be a different force. It could be much lighter or it could be far heavier. It could pull us down more heavily. So he says, imagine a tape measure that goes across the entire universe and it's marked in one inch increments, tape measure. If gravity, wherever you put gravity on that scale, on that tape measure, you, you marked it, that's where it is right now. If you moved it one inch, you don't get life. That's on one inch compared to the entire universe. So gravity is so finely tuned, it's gotta be exactly right. If you just barely move it, make it, make it pull a little harder, make it release a little bit more, you don't get life. You got large scale design. Let's talk about that for just a second. We mentioned this last week. The Earth is tilted just right. It reflects just the right amount of light. It, uh, it, it has seasons. It has the right kind of gases in the atmosphere. I mean, they're finding more and more of these things that have to be just right to have life here on Earth. Then we have to be in the right kind of solar system. If you don't get the right kind of sun, the sun has to burn at a certain kind of temperature. The sun has to be a certain color. The sun has to be a certain size. We have to be in the right spot. They call that the Goldilocks zone, right? Not too hot, not too cold. You've got to have big planets on the outside because they protect us from asteroids coming in and smacking us all the time. So we have to be in the right kind of, of uh, solar system. We have to have the right kind of moon going around us. We have to be in the right kind of galaxy. I like that. It's like you are here. <laughs> So it's got to be the right kind of galaxy, and we have to be in the right spot in the galaxy. We can't be near the center. Why not? Why do you think that would be a bad idea? Too many, too many suns going off. Yeah, 
radiation unbelievable. And maybe there was a black hole there. You know, so you have a very short existence at that point. So, yeah, not, not a good spot to be. So you've got to be in the right distance on, in our galaxy. We have to have the universe with all these uh, constants, all these uh, parameters have to be exactly right. I want to show you a quick video. It's just three minutes. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have time. You know what? I'm going to, if I have time, I'll show it later, all right? Is that okay? Because we need to knock off in a few minutes here. How about the small scale? Same thing. We did this last week. Remember we looked at DNA and how DNA is structured? And we looked at those little rotary motors. On the small scale, there's an amazing amount of detail. So are we the only ones, Christians the only ones, noticing this? Or have others, even out and out blatant atheists, noticed this? Well, here's a guy, Steven Weinberg. He's not just an atheist. He's really hostile to Christianity. But here's what he had to say. He said uh, he's expressed amazement at the way just one of these factors in the universe is. He says it's remarkably well adjusted in our favor. I like that, remarkably well adjusted. He didn't use the word miracle, but he's on the way, isn't he? I mean, it's remarkably well adjusted. How about Paul Davies? We already quoted from him. He said there's a powerful evidence that there's something going on behind it all. Seems as though somebody, we, we would probably capitalize that, right, as Christians, it seems as though somebody's fine-tuned all those numbers in nature to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. How about Anthony Flew? I've got to tell you a real quick story about Anthony Flew. In the late 20th century, if you were an atheist and you wanted to write a paper about atheism and you wanted to support it with really good uh, evidence, you went to Anthony Flew. He was the atheist atheist, right? He was the one guy atheist champion. He was a nice guy. Uh, but he was real firm on his atheism and just as sharp as they come. He'd write books, he'd write articles, and here's the fun part, he would debate Christians. And after debating Christians, and they started presenting this new evidence that's coming out on design, here's what he finally said. The findings of more than 50 years of DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormously powerful argument to design. And before he died, he died uh, just a couple of years back, he wrote a book and he says, I'm not an atheist. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Now, I don't think he went all the way to the Christian God, but he said there's something out there. More like a deist that says, <clears throat> there's some kind of God, you know, kind of fuzzy on the details. But what a step, huh? He gave up his whole life's work. Now, how do you think other people, uh, uh, scientists or, or others that had bought into atheism, do you think they were kind toward him? They don't like those kinds of changes, right? They were angry at Thomas Nagel, and they said, well, yeah, of course, uh, Flew, uh, he's, he's old, he's just losing it. So they blamed it on senility. Isn't that amazing? Instead of saying, well, this gives us something to think about. No, they just rejected it. Now, I'm sure there were some that were convinced by it, but Anthony Flew, for heaven's sakes. <clears throat> Again, I like analogies. So somebody here who's an astrophysicist has said this, picture, picture this. The precision of design is what he's talking about, is if you could throw a dart across the whole universe and hit a bullseye that was one millimeter in diameter on the other side. Good luck, right? I mean, this, there's that kind of precision in this universe. You don't get that by accident. Let's move on to something else, though, so, uh, origin of human beings. Look, look carefully, you may have a great, 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 great grandfather in there somewhere, <laughs> right? This, this, was, uh, this is obviously not the Christian perspective. I took this from um, the biological evolutionary website. What you have to do is you have to follow it. it. Go from top left to the right, go down a level, middle row, left to right, bottom row, left to right. And so you end up, eventually you get from ape-like, what they call hominids, which are sort of creatures that are, look human a little bit, you know, same body structures and all. And then gradually you end up with Homo sapiens, which is bottom right. Up there at the top is uh, Australopithecus. I don't know if you've heard of that one. So this is, the, this is the story that we get, right, when we hear the evolutionist perspective. We split off, right, the, the apes went one way, we got some kind of common ancestor, and then here's our progression over the last couple million years. Well, how's that been doing lately? So I'm going to give you some things that have shaken up the whole industry of early hominids. They used to think that because evolution happened so fast and it was, it was such an easy thing to happen that 
humans were sort of popping up all over the place, right? The group them would evolve over here, a group would happen over here, because after all, mutations happen and evolution is true, so therefore you got all these creatures that are starting to become human all over the place. Well, guess what? They've given up on that theory. That hasn't worked. And now they think there was one spot where humans came from North Africa or the Middle East, right around there. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> That's the story we get in Genesis. One couple, right? One spot where the human race started. They're starting to buy into that now, even from a non-Christian perspective. They can't find any evolutionary connections, right? You see these again one more time? This is so convenient. This is so nice and neat. The problem is they have no way to connect these. Even if you buy into them as different you know, groups of animals, you, they can't connect one to the next. There's no logical progression, even though they'll show you such. Lately, they can't find that at all. In fact, every time they come up with a new discovery, a new set of bones, they can't figure out how to fit it in and there's just nothing but arguments, right? And disagreements and confusion about that tree that's supposed to go from semi-ape to us. They can't find that at all. And then here comes another Big Bang. Thousands of years ago, and again, you know, I don't know how you buy into or how you feel about the, the time period, but they say something like several thousand years ago, there was something called the Anthropological Big Bang. So we had the Cosmological Big Bang, we had the uh, Cambrian Big Bang, and now you've got an Evolutionary Big Bang, and now you've got this Big Bang. All of a sudden, wherever humans were, things start popping up that would come from a creative mind, right? You get things like fish hooks, sculptures, paintings, musical instruments. Trade is starting to take place. But it's all of a sudden, it really puzzles people. It's, they're saying, well, wait a minute, if we had this million years, you know, it seems like it should sort of happen periodically and kind of quietly and slowly. It's not. There were, there were none of these things happening, and then all of a sudden all of these things are happening. Right? Just like the Cambrian explosion. Minimal animal life and then all sorts of exotic animal life. Again, somebody sat down, maybe too much time on his hands or her hands, calculating what it would take to get from a, a bacteria to a human being. And the odds were, I ran out of room real fast here, Put down 24 million zeros and then a one, right? Point zero 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 one. Right? That's basically no odds at all. Right? It's just incomprehensible. Now, somebody may say to you, and uh, I've heard it, that hey, wait a minute, there's got to be evolution because uh, humans and chimps share a lot of DNA. You heard that one? Uh, that's a, that's an argument that's made. Well, you know what they're finding recently? Yeah, they share a lot of DNA. But it's that missing DNA, the difference, that makes a world of difference when it comes to animals. So it changes, as I listed here, biochemistry, anatomy, behavior, all the things that make humans humans happen in that 15% of which we differ. I think somebody once said we have about, I forgot what the percent is, we share a percent of our DNA with bananas. Okay, so you know, I, I wouldn't worry about this connection of our DNA. <laughs> I just call this last area, I just call it inconvenient discoveries. Okay, it's just more like lumping stuff together because they were just fun and I just wanted to, to end on some little lighter hearted things here. Uh, one is bacteria haven't changed for 150 years. Now bacteria can reproduce so fast that they're able to run through just generation after generation, you know, over an extended period of time. They, they haven't been able to turn bacteria into anything else. They're, they're still bacteria. Well, if evolution works, how come they're not changing? Uh, have you heard of junk DNA? You heard that term? Well, don't use it and, and get after people who do use it. No, be nice about it. But junk DNA, just recently they had a, a huge project called the ENCODE. E -N, you've heard of it? Yeah. E-N-C-O-D-E. -E. It stands for something. It's an acronym. But they looked at this so-called junk DNA. Now, the, the story was junk DNA is in our system because we have mutations, right? We're evolutionary products evolution's product. So we have this junk DNA in us because we've had dead ends, right? We've had mutations that haven't produced anything good, but it's still sitting in our DNA. So then they look at DNA and they see this junk and they say, see, yeah, that's proof, evolution. Well, this ENCODE project took a look at that junk DNA and they said, bad term, right? Don't use junk DNA. They're finding that 80% right now of DNA is useful and the leader of this ENCODE thing, not a Christian, this is not a Christian organization, he says he's guessing it'll be 100% useful DNA. They just don't know what it does right now. They've been calling it junk. It's not junk. It's doing things, but it's doing subtle things. So we need it, right? Uh, you're, not, you're not made of junk, right? So you're okay. Uh, random processes are finding out can't produce information. Okay, here comes the fun stuff. 
I remember years ago, people uh, told me, and I'd see it in, in magazine articles, hey, the Earth's been around here a long, long time. Just chance operating, right? If you have enough random events over time, you can produce anything. And they'd always come up with this example. If you had a million monkeys sitting around in a huge room, and they're all banging away on a typewriter, and you give them enough bananas, given enough time, they're going to type the great works of Shakespeare, and they're going to type Moby Dick, and they're going to type the play Hamlet, and all this kind of stuff. Is that still going around? I mean, that's, the, that's what I grew up on. People are always telling me, yeah, given enough time, you know, you get enough monkeys together and you're going to create great works of art. Okay, well, somebody did the research on this. So I'm, you're going to get involved here. You're going to have to answer a question here. So suppose these monkeys could type. Now, you've got a million monkeys, right? So that's a good size group of them. And they're going to type for a million years. Right? So keep that in mind. A million monkeys for a million years. And they're typing 45 words a minute. That's a pretty good clip. I'm a two-finger typist, so I would not make it in this group. But 45 words a minute, no stops, right? No breaks, no sleep, just hammering away. And of course, a lot of it's going to be nonsense, right? Because they're monkeys. They don't know. They're just whacking out on these keys here and see what they get. So how many years do you think would have to go by, according to this study, before not typing all of Moby Dick, just the first three words, call me Ishmael. That's how Moby Dick opens up. So they have to go capital C, then A, and then LL, then a space, right? I've got to hit the space bar, and then me, and then space, and then capital I, Ishmael, period. Okay, any guesses? How long would that take? You've got a million of them working on them without a break, a million years. 700,000. 700,000 years, huh? Wow. <laughs> you don't have much faith in those monkeys. <laughs> well, here's the answer. They figured out 2,100 trillion years, which is way longer than the universe has been around. So this whole idea that you know, if you get random chances going on, eventually they'll produce something. No, they won't. In fact, Astronomy Magazine, again, no friend of Christians, had a, a lead article by a guy who mentioned this monkey thing. He said this random idea that life gets started according to random events is simply not any kind of useful hypothesis. We'd do better, he says, just to say it's a mystery. So here's a guy who would probably like to to say that that could work, but he, he tried these numbers out and he said, that's just impossible. He said, we give up, right? It's just a mystery. They did a computer study, by the way. They called it the Monkey Shakespeare Simulator. <laughs> uh, they took, they, they, they tried to get another play of Shakespeare's to get produced. The best they could do, they got 24 letters, but it took them the equivalent of 2,700 trillion, trillion, trillion monkey years. All right, so what, how, all they're saying is, what are the odds of getting life started and getting it, you know, moving along to something useful in this world? About zero. So if the monkeys can't do it, we're in trouble, right? How about some predictions to kind of end up here? I think there are going to be more problems for this origin of life. They just, they're just butting their heads against walls. Probably they're going to come up with more missing links. Don't worry about it. They'll have something on the Internet. They'll say, hey, they found such and such in Africa. A lemur, you know, and that it's it's on its way to becoming a human. Well, just wait a while. Let the uh, the initial flash and pizzazz quiet down and see where it goes. It, usually, these things end up in dead ends. Uh, they're going to do more SETI. I, I don't think they're going to have any good results from that. Uh, the fine tuning. They just keep adding to the total good things that they find. Uh, how the universe is balanced. Uh, humans are going to be seen far differently from other animals. Um, junk DNA talk, I think it's going to go away. And then I wanted to end on something here called intelligent design. I think that's going to grow in its power. And we haven't really talked about intelligent design. I don't think we did last week. Intelligent design is a movement that is really growing by leaps and bounds. You can go online if you want to, to uh, discovery.org and see the lead organization. All they say is this. They say, we're not going to get into the religious arguments. In fact, they have some people working for them who are atheists. But they do have some Christians. But they said, we're not going to get into a religious argument. We're just going to say, looking at the universe, the big scale and the small scale, there's a whole lot there that suggests not randomness, but it suggests design. And that's as far as they go. But it is really cracking open this whole evolution is correct theory, right? Because they're finding so many flaws with that. And uh, here's an example. Do you see Mount Rushmore there? Okay, nobody goes up to Mount Rushmore and says, isn't that amazing what erosion and rain and wind can do, right? Everybody laughs in here because you know that's not random processes at work. How come? Because there's what's called specified complexity, right? It's, it's specific. It looks like certain people that we know 
and it's really complex, right? A, a lightning strike will not do this. It's going to take complex work over a lot of years with a plan, with a map, with people who are very carefully chopping away at this hillside. So that's what, ran, uh, what intelligent design is trying to focus on. What features, not everything, but what features of the universe suggest design? So Discovery Institute's a good place to start. Uh, I think you might enjoy that. Um, I like this as a concluding comment. This is Louis Pasteur, the famous microbiologist, the guy who discovered uh, vaccine against rabies. He said, science brings men nearer to God. And that's so true these days, right? So I'm, I'm glad you're alive now, not 100 years ago. You might have questioned your faith. But uh, the Judeo-Christian worldview is providing science with a lot of good answers.